Hello, and welcome to the Christian Habits Podcast. This is the podcast that will help you break free from your strongholds, draw closer to God, and develop habits that will help you love God and others better. And now, here's your host, Barb Raveling. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have all of you here. And it's nice to have you here at this time of the year because we're still early enough in the year that we're all thinking, oh, life could be hopeful. We're making our goals. We're making our plans. We're thinking we're going to change and excited. So I'm hoping that you will have a good year, a good year of Christian growth, a good year of working on your goals. And if you are working on goals this year, I just want to let you know that my I Deserve a Donut app, the Android version of it, is now up and running again. You can access that in the Google Play Store. So it's good to have that up and running again. And sometimes, you know, we make goals in kind of all the traditional areas of our life, like, you know, losing weight, starting to exercise, cleaning out the garage, you know, just all those regular things. But we don't always make goals in the area of, say, for example, learning how to experience more peace and joy. And that's where today's podcast comes in, because I'm going to be interviewing Brant Hansen about his new book uh, called Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance, and Experiencing Real Joy in a World Gone Mad. And usually I introduce the people right on the little interview while I'm talking to him. Well, this time I'm going to read out his bio before he gets on. So if it seems like there's a funny little transition, that's why, because I'm doing things different. So let me tell you about Brant. He is a best-selling author. He is a syndicated radio host, an advocate for healing children with correctable disabilities through Cure International Children's Hospital. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the podcast his award-winning radio show, The Brant Hansen Show, airs on top stations in the U.S. and Canada. His podcast, The Brant and Sherry Oddcast, has been downloaded more than 15 million times. He has been named Personality of the Year multiple times by Christian Music Broadcasters. It's called Christian Music's Most Beloved Radio Personality by Christian Voice Magazine. Brant writes about varied topics related to faith, including masculinity in his book, The Men We Need, and forgiveness in Unoffendable, about which he was recently interviewed on ABC's Good Morning America. And today we'll be talking about Brandt's newest book on the topic of joy. And since this book won't be out for another two weeks, you guys can still get in on the pre-order bonuses if you order the book before January 16th. The pre-order bonuses include the first three chapters of the book, a five-day devotional, encouraging quote cards and a discussion guide, and also an opportunity to enter some sweepstakes, which Brant will tell us more about at the end of the podcast. Okay, let's get to that interview. It's great to have you here in the podcast, Brant. I'm honored. Thank you for making time for me. That's very kind. Well, I have to tell all you guys that I have been listening to Brant. Um, I started listening to him, I think when he started his podcast, I don't know how long ago, but Brant and Sherry have a podcast. What is it called? The Oddcast? What's it called, Brant? Yeah, it's just called Brant and Sherry Oddcast. So, oh, yeah. Odd. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's very fun and yeah, has lots of good things he talks about on it. And I just, I didn't even know you'd written some books. So I'm excited about your new book. I love the title. It's called Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance. So why don't you tell us about what the book is about? It's about joy. and why it's so weird. We live in a world that almost doesn't want to tolerate joy because it's like, well, there's all this stuff going on. What about this? What about that? What about the news here? What about the injustice there? What about this? Other? Like all that's true. But Jesus told us we don't have to be anxious and we don't have to worry. And he's not being unrealistic. Like people, people will think, well, but there's all this stuff going on now. No, no, no. He was he was facing all sorts of stuff. Everybody listening to him was facing anxiety producing events squared. Like you can live this way, you can change and become someone who is is less anxious and not worried. And I, I love the definition of joy that Dallas Willard gives, which is a deep, pervasive sense of well being, regardless of circumstances. So you you can grieve and still be joyful. Like you can you can be there can be things that happen that are very depressing 
like legitimate things and you can still be joyful. There could be chaos happening in the world and anger and anxiety and you could still be joyful. You still have this sense of well-being. So that's what the book is about. And uh, it's just funny because, again, a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, are just like, well, I need to be worked up about this or anxious about that. And um, it, it's worth reexamining why you don't actually need to be anxious. So that's what that's what it's about. I try to make it funny, too, but that's in the eye of the beholder. You never know. <laughs> <don't like it. laughs> oh, no, it's very funny. And I love your little drawings. He has very funny drawings in the book. Like, I'd like to just go through. I think you should make a book just of your art, Fran. It's so great. <laughs> it's funny, like people can't see it, but there's it's literally stick people. But the the publisher said I, I had offered to do this several books ago, and they're like, no, no, we're good. And then finally they're like, you know what? We would like some of your stick people in here. So I like it because it lightens the atmos. I think there's some depth here in this book, but I, I like the I like keeping a lighter touch to things. There you go. Now, if you guys review his book on Amazon. Say something about how great the stick figures are so we get those in more of his new books. That's great. Yeah. So fun. <laughs> well, I think, you know, everybody, we all like to be joyful. And I totally get why what you mean about how sometimes people are saying, no, you can't be joyful with all that's going around. So anyway, I, I agree with you 100% everything you've said so far. So the question I have is, how do you become joyful? Because that's kind of sometimes hard. You can't just turn your emotions around on a dime. So how do you do that? No, you can't, but there are things that you can do. And I, I do talk about a number of ideas here. <laughs> like the idea that you can capture your thoughts is really true. You can take your thoughts captive and you can speak to yourself in ways that remind you of what's true. And it matters. Like if, you, if you're caught in an anxiety trap or you're thinking thoughts that are obsessive or there's there's things that like you're worked up about, you can say, you know what, all that stuff may be true, that, that these things are happening, but this is also true. And you talk, you can tell yourself again about the goodness of God. So that's repeated in the Bible. David's like, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your trust in God. He's talking to himself. Same thing with like in, in Lamentations. It's Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. We're in big trouble. You know, it's all going to go down. It's going to be horrible. And then the next sentence is, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. His faithfulness endures forever. His mercies are new every morning. So it's like, yeah, all of this is happening. Yet I call this to, I call it to mind. I bring it to mind. So Paul's like, look, put your mind on whatever's true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Like, anything excellent or praiseworthy you can you can actually dwell put put your attention on the right things and that over time helps you become a different sort of person who's less anxious i i i know it's true another thing i'm big on that i talk about in the book and i actually encountered this idea and it was a it's not a christian book it was about management techniques or whatever i didn't get all the way through it but one of the ideas this guy said he outsources everything. He gets a personal assistant, like in India, and he says, "Well, you know, I, I have her take care of all my stuff, so I don't have to worry about it." He's like, "Then I had something I really needed to worry about. Like I was really worried about something." And as a joke, he said, "When I was talking with my assistant, I said, "Hey, can you worry about this for me today?'" <laughs> and she's like, "Okay." She's in India or whatever. She's like, "Yes, sir. I'll worry about that for you today." <laughs> But he said, I did it as a joke. And again, he's not coming at it from a Christian standpoint, but he said it worked. Like just knowing someone else out there was worried about it actually helped me. And I'm thinking about all those references, this Old Testament, New Testament, both about casting your cares on God, like outsourcing your worry to him. So you 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 tell him what you need. And, you're, and then you tell him that you're thankful for all the things that you go through the gratitude list of things you're thankful for. And then the peace of God will guard your heart, it says in Philippians. But you're literally outsourcing, you're casting your cares on him. You're like, that's this isn't even my department. What I'm worried about right now, it's not my department. I'm going to hand that to you. And um, that's actually a technique that works. And it's it's repeated in the Bible. The difference between the the personal assistant in India and the Lord, of course, is that the Lord can actually do something about it. Like, how much better is that? So 
these are things we're told to do. The, the book has a lot of different ideas from different angles, but that's those are two big things in terms of becoming a different sort of person who's not who's not anxious. Yeah, I love that idea about outsourcing uh, your worries. And as you're thinking about it, I thought of what is difference between now and back in the old days in the Bible is that we have a really big way to insource worries. Like whenever we get on the internet or social media, we're insourcing all those worries we see happening out that um, out there. And I know you talk about that a little bit in your book. So can you well, tell a little bit about that? Yeah, I took several angles on that, but you're right. You can onboard worries that you wouldn't have even been aware of a couple hundred years ago or, or even 50 or certainly a thousand. Like there's things we're not made for that. We are not designed to carry all of this stuff. And believe me, there's tons of stuff you can find all over the world to get mad about and to be anxious about, but we're not designed for it. My thing is like, look, peace is something that Jesus gives his followers. It's 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 his peace. It's his gift to us. And the weird thing is that we would cash that back in. Like, hey, thanks for the gift of peace, but I'm going to go with uh, Fox News for the next four hours. I'm going to go with MSNBC. <laughs> Up. Like it's it's literally like I'm going to put my attention somewhere that does not cause peace. Like thank you for the gift, but I'm going to return it. And I, especially now, and I, I'm going to talk to older people right now. Like I'm I'm in my fifties now. I can count myself in there. But people older than me, we and you are supposed to be non anxious voices in our culture. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to be the ones with perspective who can take a step back, you know, sip some tea, rock and listen to someone and then offer some insight because you're at peace. Instead, a lot of times it's the older people that are the ones worked up on Mm. 24-7 news and you don't have any wisdom as a result. So we're missing this whole piece that could be calming. And then we look at the other generations and make fun of how, how anxious they are. Well... Wouldn't they be less anxious if there was a generation that was genuinely living in wisdom and peace? But they don't have that. They just have more worked up people. They're just older. So it to me, that's, that is a, a big missing piece. And it's I, the, the book is not about criticizing people at all, but it's just like, this is something we need bad. As we need people who are who are at peace and aren't anxious. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, and I love what you just said. And I, I agree, the book, is, it's not critical, it's lighthearted and funny, um, but it's insightful. And one of the things I I highlight here that kind of talks about what you were just talking about is that you say in the book, peace is at hand, the inner kind that everyone is looking for. Unfortunately, I'm afraid our church culture has taught us that the Christian life is simply about assenting to a list of truths so that we're saved. Then we make it about studying things, stockpiling information, and having some God-themed experience. But Jesus wants us to follow him. It's way more interesting, dangerous, and yes, fun. It changes us. We become different people. Please let me remind you that I'm by nature a brooding fatalist, nihilist. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I'm a different person now. So, I mean, what you're talking about is so often I think we focus on just getting saved and we don't focus on maturing and changing all those things right. that we need to change. And right. we need to as mature, as the older Christians yeah, we can help others if we do that. Keep going. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What are you going to say? Totally, like, like it's we should always be in learning mode. Always, we're disciples, right? That means learner. I'm always learning. It's good, and that keeps that keeps you in a childlike state of mind too, where you're always learning. For the rest of my days on this planet, I'm going to be learning. He's going to be showing me stuff, and he's looking for followers. Jesus isn't like I want some converts to Christianity. He wants people to follow him. And what happens is when you do that, actually do the stuff he's telling us to do, and this isn't an anti-grace thing. Some people are like, what about grace? Grace, I love, again, Willard, he's like, grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earn, right? So Jesus wants us to put these things into practice. It just so happens that the things he models for us and shows us what to do and tells us what to do will bring a better life that's more peaceful. The loving your enemies thing, the radical forgiveness thing that he's he wants us to practice, the putting away of anger, the uh, going a second mile. Like these are ways to the blessing your enemies. When you respond to somebody out of out of anger, it whips you into a frenzy. If you respond with a gentle word, you hear yourself giving that gentle word and you calm down. 
It's it's remarkable. And then you don't spend the rest of the day and night roiling over this conflict. You've you you pray for your enemies, you bless those who persecute you. This is good for you. This puts you at peace. This allows you to sleep at night. Everything Jesus is telling us is like this ticket to peace. And it's about becoming more like him because his way of living is actually the best way. He's a genius. He knows the best way. So here's our chance to do this. We keep growing in it. It is more fun. It's countercultural. And it is the way to peace. Yeah, that's great. And I guess in some ways, it's all, this has already been uh, answered by the little quote I read, but some people might listen and say, hey, easy for you to say, Brant, I bet you're one of those just peaceful, joyful people. Um, is that true or is this something you had to learn? Oh, I, I, I spent some time in the, like just laying it out at the very beginning. Like, I am not the guy you would have ever thought would write this book. Like, if I weren't a believer, I would be dressed in all black and sitting on the left bank in Paris or whatever. Just <laughs> like, But... I'm not. I'm the guy who goofs off with puppets and loves little kids and likes to go to these hospitals. I get to visit and play with kids. Like it's the sweetest thing. Um, and I directly attribute that to to God's work in my life and His mercy on me. I just I just can't say that enough. And the fact that you don't need to worry. This is the thing. Jesus isn't being unrealistic when he tells us not to worry. And he actually, one of the things, and I, I point this out in the book, but of course a lot of us are familiar with him, him going out on the lake or on the sea with his with his f- disciples in several boats, I guess, and a big storm hits. He's asleep on a cushion, and everybody's freaking out. He calms the sea, and he's like, what? Okay, you guys kind of failed this test, basically. And it was a test because it was his idea to go out there. If you look at this at the context, Jesus said, let's go do this, knowing a storm was going to come. Mm-hmm. Wanted to see how they'd handle it. Wanted them to see how they'd handle it. And then he's saying, look, effectively, do you not realize that even if the boat goes down, you're going to be okay? So we we rehearse all these, well, this could happen, that could happen. You know what? It could And you're going to be okay. If you put your trust in God, you're honestly going to be okay. And I have a sneaking suspicion that in the very end of things, when we look back on our lives, we're going to go, you know what? I never needed to be worried. (laughs) I never did. Isn't that something? Like, I never did. And so I try to liken it to, like, if you know how something ends, It's a lot easier to take. And I I liken it to watching a game of your favorite team after it's over, you rewatch it. Maybe your team has a great comeback and wins at the last second. Well, if you're watching it live the first time, you get agitated with the referees, you get agitated, you know, this, that thing happened. Oh no, now we're falling behind. Oh no. But if you already know who wins, the next time you watch it, you're not agitated by that stuff. You're still excited that your team, like everything's going to be okay. You know it. So there's a big part of this that's reminding ourselves, calling truth to mind, that in the end, I know how this ends and I can trust the character of God. I don't have all the answers for why bad things happen to good people, all that, but I know enough to trust his character. And he promises every tear is going to be wiped away. And I also, I just have have to believe in his character that things are going to make sense. And it's, we're going to say, I didn't need to be worried. Yeah, I like that. I mean, if I'm reading a fiction book and I start getting worried that this isn't going to be a good ending, I'll go yeah. to the end page, make sure it's going to be a yeah. good ending. Because I don't want to read through that whole book and have a bad ending. But I think, too, what you said about um, being willing to accept that your worry might take place. Because I think if we're not if we're not willing to accept the fact that, yeah, so what we're worried about might happen, we can't let go of the worry because we're saying, oh, I have to have it. And I can't be happy unless I have that. So, And and I guess knowing the final outcome, if, when life is all about God, it makes it easier to accept that other bad things might happen. It does. I understand. He, he told us, and he says, you're going to have trouble in the world. What's the next thing he says? He says, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. I mean, hello, that's that's a direct thing. Like, you're going to have major problems, but be of good cheer. So 
that should sort of be who we are, right? Like, so when Paul's talking about have so much hope that people have to ask you why, that you're just, you're so weirdly hopeful. Everybody else is like, but this, but that. Are you naive? Don't you know what's, no, I know what's going on. I know more though. I'm not naive about what the reality, I know, I, I, I understand more about reality. That would be my, my position on this. I know that God is good. I know that it ends well. And so I talk about, I refer to this one French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, talked about a second naivete, but he, he said there's a second naivete that lies at the far side of complexity. And here's what I think he meant, and I may not understand it well enough, but when you're when you're little, you can just be like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And then you encounter all these complexities and big questions and objections and all the problems and just, oh, what about this? What about that? But there's a second naivete on the far side of all of that, where you get back to, you know what? Jesus loves me. I know that. And, um, you know, we can wrestle with the other stuff, but I know that. And people will look at you if you have a childlike faith like that later in life. You have to, you just trust God. People will think, well, what is, he doesn't understand all the complexities. And we're like, actually, I, I do. I went through that. But now I'm over here again. And it's, it is a childlike humility that's ready to dance, ready to have fun, ready to laugh with people, that isn't burdened by everything. I mean, that's. A person that's at ease now, who isn't anxious, who isn't angry, that guy or that lady is uh, a standout. That is a bright light now. Yeah. And a lot of times I feel like that happens as we wrestle through each of the new trials in our lives. Because like we might be peaceful, joyful, new trials come, we're all anxious, but we have to wrestle through with God, learn how to see life in that trial from his perspective accept what might happen and then trust them, have that childlike faith you're talking about that. And and then as we keep doing it in each situation in life, it just gets easier and easier. It seems like. It does. it does. I think that's right. I think it's training. I think it's practice. And I think it's a really good thing. You know, one thing I've learned while I was writing the book, I, I heard some podcast about neurology and Christianity. It was really good, but they talked about how to be grateful. And I had, I never thought about it this way. So I, I put it in the book. But they said, instead of just making a list of here's things I need to be thankful for, there's nothing wrong with that. But like you make a list, that's just part, that's just on one half of your brain. That's the analytical side. Instead of doing that, they said, think of one time in your life when you were just really grateful or there if something was really beautiful. You're glad it happened. It might be just one, one moment you saw a sunset in the Appalachians or you're at the beach or the birth of your child or... The first time you met that friend who's so dear to you now, just some moment. He said, just spend 20 seconds putting yourself in that moment. And then just say, thank you, Lord. I'm like, that's pretty good because it puts you in a different space. It's the other side of your brain. And then you come up with a list of those things. You can put it on your phone, on the notes app or something. Eight, 10, 20 of those moments that you're so grateful for that happened and you can just go there anytime and thank God. And it's, it's not just analytical at that point. You're bringing your whole self into this gratitude thing. It's very difficult. We know this from research. It's very difficult to be anxious and grateful at the same time. Mm. Very difficult. I dare say impossible. Same thing with anger. You can't be angry and grateful. One, one chases out the other. So you choose you choose which which heart you want to have, and you shape it based on what you pay attention to. So what I'm paying attention to today is who I'm going to be tomorrow. So that's that's just the way we're, we're made. So I want to call to mind the things that are true and lovely and pure and admirable, and I want to bring gratitude deliberately as a, as a practice to God and thank Him for what He's done. And then the peace of God, it says, will guard our hearts. As we live in Christ Jesus, says in Philippians. That's pretty sweet. Well, that's so great. I just feel like you've given us so much helpful hints and, and good, good ideas for finding joy. And I know you bring joy to a, a lot of people all all over the world through your 
the helping with cure. Could you tell us a little bit about that before we close? Oh yeah. So this, I, and I'll, I'll, keep, I'll make this short, but it's like the best kept secret on the planet. And I'm not exaggerating. It's, it's amazing. When I first visited one of these hospitals, I asked, why have I not heard of this before? This, this thing called cure. And they literally said, well, we're surgeons. We're kind of busy. And I'm like, everything else is a bunch of PR first, right? But this is like, they're doing the thing. So Cure is eight permanent hospitals. They're in some of the poorest countries in the world. People come from a thousand miles away with their children. It's pediatric neurosurgery, pediatric orthopedic surgery, all done in the name of Jesus. It's for kids with treatable conditions. They've got a disability that we can fix. And if they were in America to be fixed lickety split, they'd be walking when they're baby, you know, they're where they're toddlers. But if they have like ignored club foot, they're 16 years old, they can't walk. And we can fix it. Hmm. So there's some Jesus followers who are like, well, we should do that. So these hospitals are so brilliant because they're top-notch sur- surgical hospitals, healing maybe 20,000 kids a year. There's nothing like this in the rest of the world. And again, it's all done in the name of Jesus. They pray over the kids in the OR. They pray with the moms and dads. They have devotions. They've got music going on in the hospitals. It's just top-notch professionals. And it's just Jesus all the way through it. So it's literally doing what Jesus told us to do, which is to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God in Luke 9, 2. But people haven't, but most people haven't heard of it. When they see it, it's at cure.org. And I'm telling you, it's the most Jesus-shaped thing I've ever seen in my life. So I'm skeptical about a lot of Christian stuff. I don't see the connection between like that and what Jesus, who he is and what he told us to do. But this is so directly, obviously good. And, and by sharing Jesus with people and healing their kids in the last, I just saw the figure since July. So this has been not even six months, 17,000 people have become Christians at the hospitals. Wow. And I'm not exactly, it's because- Amazing. They're healing all these people. And then the communities around them see the kids being healed, and they thought they were cursed. All of these kids and moms are told, you're cursed because of something mom did, something immoral. And so the moms are laden with this guilt, and they're told to leave the community. They've got a monster on their hands. It's a mm-hmm. curse. Like, get out before we get cursed. They walk through the door to hospital, and we're like, no, you're not cursed. You're blessed. God draws close to the brokenhearted. He knows you, and we're going to heal your child. And it's going to cost you zero dollars and zero cents. Somebody else is picking up the bill. Like, it's that good. So I visited these hospitals. I can't get enough. They're the most joyful. They're like embassies of the kingdom of God. Like, so I feel like Christians, if nothing else, even if you don't want to give to it, fine. At least know what God's doing in the world because CNN's not going to cover it. But this is happening. And you can get cynical about a whole lot of things that are going on. But there's also believers that are out here healing kids by the thousands. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's kind of cool, right? Like it's, it should be encouraging. Yeah. And I don't know if that's where the line let's dance came from in your book, because you talked about like having dance parties with the kids, yeah. right? It is. That is absolutely it. Because uh, uh, there's this joy. These kids all are at different levels of disability. Some be already, you know, having had surgery, they're healing. Others are waiting for surgery or whatever, but. Every Thursday afternoon at the hospital in Niger, it's a dance party. And there's nothing like a dance party where no one's trying to be cool. <laughs> well, I love that. Well, why don't you tell us where people can find you online? And I also want to remind everybody that this podcast is coming out two weeks before the book comes out. So you are still able to get in on those uh, pre-order bonuses. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about that quick? Yeah. So if you want, you can just go to brandhanson.com. It's my name and you can find it. If you oh, it's something I just found out just now is Barnes and Noble. If you want to get it now before it comes out. So Barnes and Noble is doing a sweepstakes where it's so it's totally fun. If you pre-order it on the Barnes and Noble site, um, they're giving away a disco ball, an Uno. It, it's a long story, but wow. just, just stuff that's mentioned in the in the book, plus like a $75 Barnes and Noble gift card. And actually some of my artwork, they're having me sign it. Oh, that's so fun. It's just a totally fun extra thing, but you might get a kick out of that if you want to do that. Well, and who doesn't want the disco ball? Yeah, a free disco ball. I mean, it, that, that's not usual with the books. So, <laughs> Okay. And then remember your podcast and your radio show. Uh, can you tell us the name of those again? Just because I know you guys might want to check those out. Sure. The radio show is just called The Brand Hansen Show. It's on, I don't know how many 
it's a lot of radio stations across the country and in Canada. But uh, Brant and Sherry Oddcast is our podcast. And it's very goofy, as you know. And then we offer some, hopefully, some insight on stuff, too. Very, very goofy. Okay. Well, anyway, this is a super helpful book. If you guys want to uh, let go of anxiety and, and anger and learn to be joyful. So I just really appreciate you coming on to talk to us about it, Brant. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in this week. It's been great having you. I hope you have a good week, and I will talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Christian Habits Podcast. If you'd like more help with stopping and starting habits, check out Barb's blog at www.barbraveling.com.